Hello and welcome everybody to this Global Fleet Champions webinar on essentials checks to manage work-related road risk, kindly sponsored by DriveTech. If you are new to our webinars, Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Break the Road Safety Charity to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. To learn more about the work that we do and to access more of our resources and events, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. Our webinar today looks at essential checks to manage work-related road risk. If you employ anyone who drives to work, you need to know that they meet the physical and legal requirements to be safe on the roads. Regular health and license checking should be included in any risk management policy, as they will help you determine whether your staff are fit to be behind the wheel and that they're fully permitted to do so. In this webinar, you will learn what can be learned by carrying out regular license and driver health checks, when and how you should conduct checks to secure the results you need, and how to use data to shape your risk strategy. In a moment, a multiple choice question poll will appear on your screen so that we can find out your views on this topic. It is anonymous, simply select one answer and press submit, and we will discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which will take place at the end of today's presentations. You can put forward your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on the webinar panel. I'd like to say a big thank you to today's sponsor, DriveTech, and the poll question will appear on your screen shortly and the webinar will then begin. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Emma Loveday as an internal fleet risk consultant within our commercial fleet business. Uh, I've been working in the fleet industry for 10 years, specialising in occupational road risk, driver risk management and driver safety education and training. Prior to joining DriveTech in December last year, I previously held roles at Thames Water and Mighty, managing their occupational road risk, establishing effective driver training programmes um, and aiding best practice in relation to on-road at work driving activities. At DriveTech, I advise many complex organisations with diverse fleets, helping them to implement relevant and effective driver risk management programmes to reduce collisions, improve driver wellbeing behind the wheel and ultimately save lives. I'm just going to play a brief video now to tell you all about DriveTech. Here at DriveTech, a business wholly owned by the AA, we serve the business driver community in the UK and internationally, providing a range of driver risk management and driver training services. We are also the UK's largest provider of police re-education training courses, working with 34 police forces across the country. Within our dedicated fleet risk management offering, DriveTech offers a comprehensive range of driver and driver risk management services designed to help businesses demonstrate their duty of care to their driving community, as well as reducing costs and saving lives. And now, to introduce you to the comprehensive range of DriveTech services to support you. Pulse, fleet risk health check comprehensive and actionable fleet risk health check for your business covering policies, drivers, vehicles and journeys. Licence checking. If you're responsible for managing employees in your organisation while they drive for work, you must ensure that they have a valid driving licence. Driver risk assessments. Are your company drivers at risk? A cost effective and accessible way to assess your company driver's risks whilst keeping downtime to a minimum. E-learning targeted 10-minute interventions designed to support your drivers and help them improve their knowledge in relation to reducing driving risk. Virtual workshops. Communicating safety messages and improving driver knowledge through virtual workshops can be a key component of a successful road risk reduction program. On-road coaching. Practical driver training for maximum impact on driver safety and performance. Recommended for drivers who have been identified typically by an online assessment as being high risk. Our business operates in the UK and works with multi-country international fleets as well through DriveTech International. Our training is available on road and online and in the current COVID climate we have strived to adapt our existing solutions and introduce more innovative products that offer our customers alternatives to traditional face-to-face -face and in-vehicle training. DriveTech, celebrating 30 years of successful trading this year, are established thought leaders in the driver risk and training industry. We are proud of our associations with our customers, some blue chip and leading Fleet 200 organisations among them. 
and we strive to add real value, helping to educate your business drivers, improving road safety and employees' behaviour behind the wheel, providing eco-driving benefits too, not to mention saving lives. Driving is the most dangerous work activity that most people do, and it contributes to far more accidental deaths and serious injuries than all other work-related activities. Very few organisations can operate without using the road. Millions of vehicles, lorries, vans, taxis, buses, company cars, motorcycles are used for work purposes every day. So why should organisations manage this risk? The reasons can be summarised into three key categories. The law. There are two key pieces of legislation that can relate to road safety management. The Health and Safety at Work Act, or HASWA, and the Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act. HASWA applies just as much to on-road work activities as to any other work activity. Employers have duties under health and safety law for these on-road work activities. The Act states that employers must, so far as reasonably practicable, ensure the health and safety of all employees while at work. This includes any driving undertaken on behalf of the employer. Employers must also ensure that others are not put at risk by their work-related driving activities. Employers are responsible for ensuring that work-related journeys are safe, staff are fit and competent to drive safely, and the vehicles they use are fit for purpose and in a safe condition. If one of your employees is killed, for example, while driving for work, and there is evidence that serious management failures resulted in a gross breach of a relevant duty of care, your company or organisation could be at risk of being prosecuted under the Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act. Organisations convicted of corporate manslaughter face unlimited fines that are linked to annual turnover. They also face remedial orders and publicity orders. Managers convicted under Health and Safety Offences Acts can also face high fines and prison sentences. You also have duty of care under tra road traffic law, such as the Road Traffic Act. Regulations require employers to ensure that vehicles used for work purposes are safe and legal to be on the road and that drivers are properly licensed and insured. Employers can be held liable for various cause or permit road traffic offences. For example, it's an offence to cause or permit someone to use a handheld mobile phone whilst driving, for example, or use a vehicle in a dangerous condition. Individual drivers can also face fines and penalties, driving disqualifications and, in serious cases, imprisonment under road traffic law. Of course, these are all examples of UK law, and if you operate a fleet internationally, there may be other laws that you need to be made aware of. Um, financial. There are obvious financial reasons for managing occupational road risks. With effective management, organisations can see a reduction in vehicle collision and incidents, resulting in reduced accident repair costs and potentially lower insurance premiums. Having a trained driver population with an awareness of road safety and good driving skills and behaviour can result in less wear and tear on your vehicles, potentially less brake pads and clutches being worn out, and extending the life of your vehicles and increasing their reliability. Also, the less time vehicles are off the road in repair shops and garages, the higher utilisation of vehicles and employee productivity. And if you use short term hire vehicles, which can be very expensive, there is a reduced requirement for these as fewer of, fewer of your vehicles will be off the road. Worth mentioning as well, with improved driver behaviour and driving skills, you can achieve significant fuel reductions, one of the biggest expenditures for many fleets. If drivers are driving their vehicles better, less harsh braking, harsh acceleration, etc., fuel consumption will reduce. A safe driver is also an economical driver. Finally, social responsibility. I've already touched on fuel reduction, and this will have a positive impact on the environment by reducing your carbon footprint. And if you have a sustainability, environmental or corporate social responsibility policy, this can support that. Ultimately, managing road risk within your organisation is the right thing to do. Why wouldn't you want to ensure your employees were fit and safe to drive on business for you? Having an effective driver and road safety programme can increase staff morale. It's good for your corporate image, especially when you have liveried vehicles, and can also positively affect the communities we work in and the roads we drive upon, because we share those roads with so many others. Before I hand over to the main presentation, I just want to briefly touch upon why it's important to know that your drivers meet the physical and legal requirements to be safe on the roads. Regular health and licence checking should be included in any risk management policy as they will help you to determine whether your staff are adequately and legally licensed to drive and if they are fit and capable to be behind the wheel. Health checks can be physical and include things such as eyesight checks, which should be carried out every two years as a minimum. Eyesight is an essential factor when driving, yet research has estimated that there are 9 million drivers on Britain's roads with vision that falls below the legal standards for driving. 
And according to the road safety charity Brake, around 3,000 injuries every year in the UK are caused by drivers with poor eyesight. So it's crucial to be sure that your driver's vision is good enough. And if necessary, they wear glasses or contact lenses to correct their vision. This reduces the risk of accidents, injury or damage to others on the road. Another physical trek worth considering is random drugs and alcohol testing, which can deter and identify the use of substances in the workplace. This type of programme should be considered for employees that undertake work-related journeys. Being under the influence of drugs or alcohol in the workplace impairs the ability of an individual to carry out their duties. And if the individual is in charge of heavy or dangerous machinery, or indeed a three and a half ton transit van, for example, there is a genuine risk to themselves and the people around them. Driver mental health and driver well-being is also a very important factor when considering fitness to drive. Lapses in concentration, fatigue and road rage are all potential indicators of poor driver well-being. Workplace stress can also have an adverse effect on a person's ability to drive and their behaviour behind the wheel. Professional drivers have been identified as a high-risk group when it comes to mental health, and one in four people will experience a mental health problem in the UK every year. Unfortunately, checking a driver's mental health isn't quite as easy as having an eyesight check. What employers can do to help with driver mental health and well-being is to promote openness about mental health, make it a focus and a priority within your organisations. I would advise including mental health in your health and safety policies and set targets for improvement. The number of employees that are off work with stress and the number of work days lost due to stress are useful and easily obtainable measures of the mental health of your organisation and its employees. Routinely monitor the health and well-being and of your staff by scheduling regular one-to-ones and include open questions such as how are you feeling or is there anything bothering you or concerning you at the moment as part of the conversation. Ensure that all staff know who they can go to, not just their line manager for a confidential chat. Consider qualifying employees as mental health first aiders with Mental Health First, in- first Aid England. Having an employee assistance programme is also important and can offer personalised specialist assistance to help employees overcome personal issues. Finally, before I hand over, I do just want to briefly touch on driver licence checks. Licence checks are a fundamental part and often the very first stage of any driver risk management programme. A rigorous licence checking policy demonstrates organisations putting safety first, particularly when recruiting new drivers. By implementing these checks, you can make sure the employees you are hiring if they are required to drive as part of their job role, are legally and adequately licensed to fulfil their obligations behind the wheel. Not only will licence checks provide you with an employee's legal eligibility to drive, but the other information you will obtain from these checks, such as licence endorsements, will enable you to identify risks and concerns for individuals, and if appropriate, you can take remedial action. For example, if you have a driver with a number of speeding offences on their licence, you may consider a speed awareness course. More information on driver licence checks and what can be learned from them will be covered in this session. Uh, That's all from me for now. Uh, Thank you for listening. um, And I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. I'll be joining the Q&A at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, I will hopefully be able to answer those for you at the end or connect with me on LinkedIn. Emma Loveday. I'm Malcolm Maycock, the founder of Licence Bureau. Licence Bureau is the number one supplier of driving licence checking and risk management for employers in the UK. Having undertaken 5 million licence checks for UK drivers and from the latest figures from DVLA, currently 25% of all UK checks undertaken by third party suppliers. Licence Bureau is owned by TTC the UK's largest provider of speed awareness courses. In the first lockdown in 2020, the company presented online to over 100,000 drivers who have been caught speeding. Today, I am thrilled to be asked by Brake to come and discuss the cornerstone of risk management, that being driving license verification. To understand why we check driving licenses, I'd refer you to a myriad of legislation, both civil and criminal. However, for basic guidance, I always refer people to the Health and Safety Executive Guidance for Driving at Work. This leaflet, INDG382, applies to any employer with employees who drive or ride a motorcycle or bicycle at work 
as well as anyone who is self-employed. It also applies to those using their own vehicle for work-related journey. The next piece of legislation, which is extremely important, is criminal. That is Section 87.2 of the Road Traffic Act 1988. That basically states it is an offence for a person to cause or permit another person to drive on a road, a motor vehicle of any class, otherwise and in accordance with a licence authorising that other person to drive a motor vehicle of that class. So basically, if you require someone to drive on your behalf, you are required to ensure that A, they hold a driving licence and B, they hold a driving license that's relevant to the vehicle you've asked them to drive. So, who should we be looking at as drivers? Well, it's any person driving company vehicles who's employed by you, any person driving company vehicles not employed, i.e. you provide me with a company car and you allow me to have nominated drivers or any other person driving a business mile on behalf of the company. Now, what's important here is whether they claim or don't claim, it's simply that they are driving a business mile. Remember, in some organisations, claiming expenses is very difficult, and therefore some employees don't bother. It's also key to remember that health and safety law does not apply to people commuting i.e. travelling between their home and their usual place of work, unless they are travelling from their home to somewhere which is not their usual place of work. So what? What are we doing? What are we looking for? Well, initially, we're looking to see whether they hold a valid UK licence for the vehicle that they are driving, as previously explained. Also, if they don't hold a UK licence, do they hold a valid non-UK licence? So key bits here to look out for are whether the licence is expired in their own country, and if it has, it's then expired here, and also whether they're disqualified in the UK. These checks can be made even though that person's licence isn't registered in the UK, if they have received a conviction in the UK for driving offences, it will be recorded at the DVLA and therefore an inquiry can be made, not using the normal DVLA online system, but by a third party method of sending a consent form to DVLA. So also to look out for in this category, are provisional license holders. We normally find this with nominated drivers as company policies don't explain that fully or aren't fully understood by employees that their vehicle is to be driven by people with full licenses and therefore they invariably allow your company vehicle to be used as a teaching aid for their children or offspring. Also key is whether the person's got a manual or automatic license. Obviously, if they have an automatic license, they are not entitled to drive a manual vehicle. And the other key area to look at is obviously whether or not they have the right license for the type of vehicle they are driving, whether it's over three and a half tonnes, over seven and a half tonnes, and that will then come down to the age of the driver, as some people who are older will have the ability to drive vehicles that are up to seven and a half tonnes. So when do we check? Always difficult. HSE guidelines say at the time of employment and regularly thereafter. The traffic commissioners who deal with businesses that have O licences, so invariably large vehicles, HGVs and the like, they advise that you should check out quarterly. Fours, who are the scheme for Transport for London that is rolling out around the country, advise every six months 
plus quarterly if over a certain amount of points. The Freight Transport Association run a very similar scheme. And again, these are invariably for trucks, vans, etc. I believe it is important that you check everybody a minimum of six monthly. If you're checking them annually, then you are unlikely to pick up disqualifications unless people own up to it. You're also unlikely to pick up tossing up unless they own up to it. It is not uncommon for people to pick up three lots of speeding offences in a very short period of time if they are under severe stress. And that is not particularly work stress, but stress from outside. So it's extremely important that you check frequently. Last but not least, where? Where and how do I do my checking? Well, internally, you can use the DVLA website. As already stated, this is restricted for non-UK license holders, but you can use the DVLA website. As long as you've got the driver's consent and they've allowed you access to it, um, normally sending you a code. Externally, however, I would suggest that you use uh, an ADLV member, that's the Association for Driving Licence Verification. The reason I say that is that they were created as a association by the DVLA and at their request and are in constant contact with the DVLA over upgrades, changes and obviously changes in law. ADLV members undertake 85% of all third party checks in the UK, and that is in excess of over 2 million. The association was formed to deal directly as stated with the DVLA, and as an association has additional checks and balances above any DVLA requirement. And the ones that I believe are extremely important are that each of these companies has to prove they have insurance in place, they pen test annually and have qualified third parties undertake that testing. So it is not internal, it's external third parties. They have to have ongoing ISO 27001 certification in place. And look at that one. And last but not least, they have to prove their ongoing concern showing validation from the third party accountancy firm. The most important part of this is that you have the ability to record what actions you've taken. If you are subject to a third party investigation, whether it's from police, VOSA or any other third party, or even your insurer, you do have a requirement to prove that these checks have been undertaken, that they're regularly undertaken, and of course, the results that come from them. The cost of license checking is not expensive. The cost of a check at DVLA is currently 60p and is reviewed annually by the DVLA for the third party suppliers. Thank you for your time. I hope what I've provided has been of interest and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Hello. Um, first of all, thanks. For, um, thank you to Break for allowing me to share my thoughts on the importance of data as one of the essential elements of managing work-related road risks. I'm going to start today by looking at what sort of data is available from traditional sources, but actually focusing more on what technology can offer us. We'll then explore how to use this data effectively especially around the role of the line manager and supervisor, but also about the importance of reporting. Now, it's always important to look at the bigger picture when analysing any particular aspect of a work-related road risk management programme. So we'll finish off the session looking at where data fits into this and how it can help us. So I guess the first question we should ask ourselves is what sort of data is available? 
Now, I don't think we should forget about the importance of traditionally available data that you probably all got al already related to fleet management. Um, now, this would include things like notices of impending prosecution, um, data from your insurers and brokers about collisions, um, maintenance records, expense reports, all of these can provide insights to you. Now, the problem is quite often that's very lagging data and it can be weeks or sometimes months after an event that you find out that something's happened. And obviously from a management perspective, that's just too late. Now we shouldn't ignore that, um, but it's, uh, it's very old data. Now, whilst it's still lagging, data from a telemetry system can be much more immediate, you know, the same day um, often. Um, and that allows you to act much sooner. Now, the insightful things that we would take from telemetry data would be exceptions and trends relating to things like speeding. So that would be speed against the posted speed limit, but also speed against the typical speed for that road for that time of day um, uh, in those sorts of um, conditions, which data, which data you might be able to get from the, your telemetry provider. Harsh cornering, harsh acceleration, um, harsh braking, and I'm going to come back to harsh braking in a minute. Um, data from camera systems and video systems, data related to fatigue, especially around the total length of working day, and also related to how often breaks are being taken and how long those breaks are. I mentioned harsh braking before, and I, just a word of caution here. We must never discourage harsh braking, because harsh braking could be the difference between having a crash and avoiding a collision. What safe driving is all about is the eliminating the need to brake harshly. So when we're looking at braking, we should be looking at the trends of harsh braking rather than uh, particularly in, in individual instances. It could be, for example, that that person's had to brake harshly to avoid a, an animal that's run out into the road. I think the other important thing to mention here is about having a robust underlying safe driving policy. Now, the use of telemetry data is quite an advanced work-related road risk management tool and is unlikely to be effective if you don't have a strong underlying risk management framework. So as an example, you install telematics today, you turn the system on tomorrow, and surprise, surprise, you find out that a large proportion of your fleet is speeding in some situations. Now the question here is how you're gonna address this. And of course, if you don't have existing policies on this issue, what are you gonna do? So you have to have that underlying uh, framework in place before telematics data is going to allow you to do something effectively. I think it's also important to mention here that you shouldn't get overwhelmed by the data because these systems provide uh, you with a lot of data if you're not careful. What you normally require are just the exceptions and the trends and you can work with your telematics service provider to ensure that the data meets your needs. I'll talk more about reporting later. So you've now got your exception and trend data. What are you gonna do with it? I think the first thing to say here is you should never fall into the trap of assuming that any ex exceptions or trends that you're seeing are just down to bad driving. A difficult question, but the most important question you should ask initially is, what have we done as an organization that may have contributed to the observed ex exceptions and trends? Effective work-related road risk management isn't simply about having a good safety policy, although that's obviously important. What you also need to look is at your safety operational balance. What I find when I'm working with my customers is that often changes need to be made to the organization's operating practices and procedures to create an environment in which employees are able to drive safely. And what this does, that helps eliminate the need for employees to take risks to meet a business or management objective. Now, that could be anything from, uh, you know, not having to take a phone call whilst driving to, to, to having realistic number of drops in a day, for example, for a delivery driver. Now, this is a crucial point and one that many organisations overlook. I think because of this, in all but the smallest organisations, the best person to manage and act on the data is the line manager or the supervisor. They're the controlling mind of the employee and as such are best placed to influence how they drive. They know what's going on in the organization. They should be having regular debriefs with their drivers and they're best placed to determine whether there's been an organizational operational contribution to the measured exceptions and trends. 
I think the fleet or transport manager also has a role here, but their role is, is rather than acting on the data, actually making sure that the line manager and supervisor gets, gets, gets the data at the right time uh, and is not overwhelmed by that data, just gets those exceptions and trends. Reporting is a key element of any effective work-related road risk management program. What you need to do is ensure that the line managers get the exceptions and trend data when they need it. Um, the exception data should be immediate so they can follow up with the driver while it's still, whatever happened is still fresh in the driver's mind. Um, trend data can be reported uh, uh, more periodically, say monthly, but whatever works in your organization so that improvements can be recognized, um, but any negative trends can be investigated and understood. I think it's also important to ensure that aggregated data is reported to your directors and senior managers to show how your work-related road risk management program is performing. If these managers and directors don't know about your safe driving or they don't know how it's performing, well, how can they be expected to support it and to fund it? So where does this all fit into the, uh, a wider work-related road risk management program? Now, we haven't got time to go into every element of this program, but suffice to say that, that every element is important and many of the areas you see on your screen are interconnected. Now, this is uh, based on the proven health and safety management process of Plan, Do, Check, Act, but applied to the driving task. In the plan section, you'll see I've got uh, manager training in here. And this is where your line managers need to be trained in their roles and responsibilities in the driving safety program, but uh, what we're talking about today, how to interpret the exception and trend data that they're seeing and how to engage with their employees about that so they can get down to the underlying root cause, whether that root cause is a management or operational issue or something to do with the individual driver. I think the main area of the data you collect feeds is in the check section. And it provides you with indications, indicators of things that might be going wrong um, but also uh, uh, tells you the effectiveness of any interventions that you've made. And you can see changes, uh, underlying changes quite quickly in this data that's coming through. So it's really, 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 really helpful and insightful. Data also helps supplement the audit part of the process um, in the ACT phase. Uh, and that allows you to make decisions about um, what's effective and where you not, might need to refocus the entire program. Data is really, really important for this. So we started off talking about the sort of data that's available. And remember, you will, even if you don't use telemetry at the moment, you will have data that you can use from traditional fleet management uh, sources. With telemetry data, and assuming that you have robust underlying safe driving policies in place, you need to focus on the areas that can indicate likely crash involvement, inappropriate speed, harsh cornering, harsh acceleration, trends in harsh braking, and fatigue indicators. And remember, the most important question to ask initially is what you might have done as an organization that has contributed to any of these measured exceptions and trends. And it's your line managers and supervisors with the appropriate training who should be using this data and engaging with their drivers to get down to the underlying root causes. When reporting the data, you should ensure that your line managers have simple trend and exception data provided in a timely fashion, and that the senior management team, including the directors, have insights into how the data is showing that your overall risk management program is performing. Data, providing it's the right data and used correctly, is a critical part of any effective work-related road risk management program and will help you reduce the number of collisions and claims you're having. And what this will do, it will help meet your duty of care, it will lessen the chance of prosecution, and probably the most important thing for most organizations, if we're being honest, it will reduce the direct and uninsured losses associated with collisions. And what that's gonna do, that's gonna help improve your organization's efficiencies, and most importantly, its profitability. Thank you for your attention.
Good morning, afternoon, or every, evening, everyone. My name is Fawzia Ali, um, and I would like to begin with saying what an honour it is to be presenting to you all today. Um, and I'm sure you've found these presentations, quite of mine, as insightful as I have. Um, so to begin with, just a little bit about me. Um, so I am the Environment, Health and Safety Lead for an organisation called Johnson Controls here in New Zealand. Um, Johnson Controls itself is a global organisation um, and we specialise in security, fire and HVAC services. Here in New Zealand, we're located in 14 cities around the country um, and have just over 700 staff. From a fleet perspective, uh, we have a fleet size of around 440 vehicles, ranging from the smaller size hatch vehicles to bigger commercial vans and utility vehicles. Um, on average, we travel just over three and a half million kilometres every year, ranging from the very top of the North Island through to the very bottom um, of the South. As an organisation, we have got a significant focus on environment, health and safety. And this, of course, extends to road safety, where for many of our employees, their vehicle is their workplace. So I've been invited to talk about Johnson Controls and some um, initiatives that we have put in place around vehicle safety, particularly around essential checks that are required. So over the next few slides, I'm going to cover off some of these checks that we have implemented in order to ensure that we keep our drivers safe while at work. This will include fitness to drive and license checks that we undertake as well as ensuring that our vehicles are inspected and maintained routinely, and that we have appropriate training needs identified and carried out. So to begin with, um, fitness to drive. Now we all know driving demands constant attention, good judgment, the ability to maintain your vehicle, and of course, a, a positive attitude. But there are many other factors that play a part in determining whether your drivers are fit to be on the road. Arguably, one of the most important factors is whether your drivers are sufficiently fit and healthy to drive safely, and of course not put themselves and others at risk. Now there's a number of considerations that apply here, uh, including the obvious factors of eyesight and health conditions. Some personal health conditions such as heart problems and diabetes can affect driving and therefore need to be considered, particularly for high mileage drivers like we have at Johnson Controls. A number of these issues can be identified at pre-employment medical stage. And we usually work with both the prospective employee and their GP around a suitable management plan if one is required. In addition, we also ensure that our drivers are reminded constantly that they should not drive while taking medications that can impact their judgment. Again, this may require further advice from a medical professional. And then finally, it's also important that drivers are reminded of how dangerous driving while fatigued can be and what they should do if they start feeling tired. You also need to consider if your drivers are competent and capable of doing their work in a way that is safe for them and other people. Now this can include checking on driver's licenses, as well as skills and expertise, both of which I'll touch on in subsequent slides. Also under this, you may need to consider driving policies and procedures, or written instructions on your expectations for workers while they are driving. It's important that drivers have got clear instructions about how to keep themselves safe while on the road. And that can include simple things, such as how to carry out a routine safety check, how to safely adjust any safety equipment, including seat belts and head restraints, as well as what to do in the event of a crash or a breakdown. You may also need to provide written instructions so drivers are aware that they must not drive under the influence of drugs or alcohol, um, and that they must not use either a handheld mobile phone while driving, but also that even using a hands-free device can seriously affect their concentration. Finally, it is important that vehicles that are provided are fit for purpose and maintained in a safe condition. 
Again, we'll touch on this in a subsequent slide, but just a couple of key points to include, include here would be to ensure that when you are buying or leasing new vehicles, that you select those that are most suitable, both for driving as well as for health and safety, and that drivers are provided with both basic training and instructions on how to use the vehicle. Within Johnson Controls, we were seeing a number of brand new and updated models of vehicles coming into the fleet that our drivers had absolutely no idea on how to drive. Now here in New Zealand, um, as I'm sure it is elsewhere around the world, organisations must ensure that employees that are operating a company vehicle have an appropriate driver's licence class, as well as comply with any conditions that are set out within the licence. It is obviously the organisation's responsibility to ensure their employees are legal and safe to drive for or on behalf of the business. Now, the only way that organisations can be absolutely certain that their employees are permitted to drive is to carry out a check of the driver's licence, both at recruitment stage and routinely afterwards. This should be undertaken for every person in the business that is employed that, that is required to drive on or behalf of the business, as well as any nominated third party that has access to a company vehicle. Importantly, this should also include any grey fleet drivers. Now at Johnson Controls, we have got a detailed vehicle policy which sets out the requirements and standards that we expect our employees to adhere to. This includes a section where driver's license details are submitted along with a photocopy of the actual license itself. The vehicle policy also states the requirement to report any driving offences that the employee may receive to the manager immediately so that a full record can be maintained. In addition to this, we also subscribe to what's called the driver check platform, which is provided by the New Zealand Transport Agency. This is a system that allows companies to check the driver's license status for their drivers. And should a license status change at any point in time, the system automatically lets us know. You do need the driver's consent to be able to use such a service to obtain their records, and so this should be obtained at employment stage. Now, not every country may have such a system, so I would recommend doing at least a manual check routinely to ensure licenses are correct. At minimum, this should be done once a year, but you may want to consider more often for high mileage drivers or those with a poor driving record. Vehicle inspections and preventative maintenance are both cost saving and safety initiatives that all organisations should have processes in place for. Not only can this result in lower unscheduled fleet maintenance costs, but they also help eliminate expensive and unexpected repairs and reduce unproductive downtime. But most importantly, carrying out routine inspections on both our company as well as grade fleet helps to ensure that vehicles are not only safe for our own employees, but also for other motorists also. In order to have an effective inspection program, it is important that all your key stakeholders are involved. This obviously includes the drivers, but supervisors and managers who all have a key role to play in ensuring that routine fleet inspections and procedures are followed. It's also just as important to have easy to use checklists and procedures and where required, be prepared to provide your stakeholders with the training necessary to be able to fully understand these checklists and procedures, including how to identify warning signs and how to adhere to inspection programs and practices. You can select what works best for your organisation, be it, it paper-based checklists or online versions. At Johnson Controls, we do still use both methods as we obviously have fans for both systems. The one thing I will add though, is that online versions do have additional features, such as the ability to capture photos of any issues or damage as well as the ability to notify or escalate of any issues to others in real time without the need for loose pieces of paper, which can be mislaid, lost or worse.
Finally, when drivers receive uh, appropriate driver training, risk is reduced just as with any other health and safety matter. Drivers are reminded about best practices when it comes to driving, as well as any risky driving behaviours that we can all get very easily accustomed to over time. Bad habits that have been picked up from perhaps observing other drivers on the road can also be identified and hopefully eliminated. Now, as an organisation, we have provided our, driving, our drivers with training for many years. Um, however, historically, we have struggled with finding training that was suitable for the risks that were unique to us as, our, as an individual organisation. A key factor I will mention is ensuring that the training you provide your drivers is worthwhile, including ensuring that the training is actually appropriate. Now we want a training that was going to address the standard risks that everyone encounters while driving, including bad weather, irresponsible drivers, and of course everyone's favourite roadworks happening on what seems like every second road. But we also wanted to ensure that training addressed behaviours that were in line with our organisational policies, such as avoiding distractions like mobile phones while driving, fatigue, speeding, and even drugs and alcohol. We've been lucky to have partnered with a couple of different training providers now who provide us both with in-class as well as behind the wheel, group or individual training that is tailored to meet our requirements. Some of the training courses that we have found valuable in our organisation have included on the slide here. Um, the one-on-one -on -one driver assessment we've done is a detailed assessment of the driver's behaviours, attitude and capabilities from a health and safety perspective. And it includes the assessor reviewing specific competencies, such as whether the driver carries out safety checks, um, the manner in which they manoeuvre the vehicle, the way in which they handle traffic signals, speeding and road positioning. We found with this particular type of training that it's good for putting specific staff members through it. Um, for example, those that may be deemed high risk because they've received traffic infringements, um, driving complaints, or been involved in mul multiple or potentially uh, serious road crashes. Following the assessment, we receive a detailed report which outlines the driver's level of competency, as well as any recommendations for further training or coaching that may be required. The New to New Zealand course is similar to the driver assessment, but is focused on international license holders who are new to driving in New Zealand. Again, this is one-on-one -on -one coaching and it helps the driver to understand key requirements of the New Zealand road rules, road signs and customs. With New Zealand seeing a, a high emergence of immigrants into the country, it was important that we could feel comfortable that all of our drivers understood and were accustomed to the driving rules of our specific country. The next three training courses are all based upon specific requirements. Uh, with individual employees needing to complete these additional courses as required. Again, we're lucky that we have a supplier that is able to provide these unique courses to our staff as we need them. Again, usually on a one-on-one -on -one basis for the few employees that are exposed to these additional risks. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention a, a specific training course that we have put all of our staff through over the course of a couple of years. Um, and one that has provided quantifiable results for us when it comes to road crashes. With the crashes that we were having taking place in the company, the majority of these occurred at low speed, either through reversing or coming up to intersections, etc. Now, this was a particular concern for us as we were frequently out on customer sites where there are high numbers of pedestrians, um, the schools, rest homes, hospitals and the like. We were lucky to find a supplier that provided training specifically focused on the larger sized vehicles, such as vans and utility vehicles that we have, assisting our drivers with spatial awareness, as well as a focus on steering, reversing and parallel parking. And with that concludes my thoughts on the essential checks that organisations need to have to manage work-related work road risks. I'd like to thank you all for your time once again, and I wish you well for the rest of your day ahead.
that concludes the pre-recorded section of today's webinar. A big thank you to today's speakers and to Drive Tech for sponsoring the webinar today. We will now move on to the live question and answer session of the presentations. But first, we will look at the results of today. We asked you how often you check your driver's licenses. As you can see from the results, 27% of you have said you check them quarterly, 32% every six months, 32% annually, 0% every two years, and 9% said other. It'll be interesting to see if you are one of those attendees who answered other what uh, that is. You could share your response in the chat function. And just a reminder, you can still submit any question to us using the question bar on the right hand side of your screen. Um, as I mentioned, we're joined here today by Malcolm Maycock and Emma Loveday. Malcolm, um, these poll results, are these roughly in line with what you'd expect from fleet organisations or is there something surprising here? I'm, I'm actually really pleased, to be honest. I'm, I'm surprised that annually it has come down to 32%. A lot of, a lot of people have a risk basis uh, and they believe that it's just based on points, but over the past few years you'll know but speed awareness courses have increased, so a lot of people aren't picking up points per se, even though they aren't speeding. Um, that, that won't show on their driving license. So, you know, it's really, really good that people are picking up. It's every six months. So, you know, we've got over um, or just under 60% there who, who are checking. I, you know, I just need to convince the um, 41 other percent of, of the people that it's really, really important to be checking more frequently. We've seen too many people fall through the gaps, to be perfectly honest, and then become disqualified through tossing up. Great, thank you. Emma, do you have anything to add to that? I would agree with what Markham has said. It is, it is really interesting and, and, and good to see um, that the frequency of treks is, is improving. Um, I suspect that the other might be what Markham mentioned in regards to actually it's, it's a risk-based approach. So depending on how many license points uh, a driver has will then uh, determine the frequency of checks. So obviously with, with more points, more frequent checks, um, quarterly is, is, is kind of the what you would do um, if you had a driver with kind of nine or more points. But as standard, if you've got a driver with a clean license every six months is, is, is best practice really for driver license checks. Excellent, thank you. Um... Mal question um, attendee has said, my manager seems to think that we are not professional drivers and license checking is not practicable. What can I say or do to improve their understanding? Um, I think it is difficult. I mean, I, I go back to a company that I remember um, dealing with. I thought the fleet manager was breath of fresh air and it was Pimlico Plumbers. And, and he turned around and said, we are drivers that plumb. We are not plumbers that drive. Because in fact, you can't do the job for them in the first place unless you're driving. It's as simple as that. The basics is you have to get from A to B to actually do your task. So anyone who's driving at work is a professional driver. It's just that we have this persona that a professional driver is, you know, someone driving a large HGV, where in fact it's anyone driving at work and, and it is a profession and it is extremely dangerous. Mm. Great, thank I'll, you. Um, I hope that's answered your I, question. Oh, sorry, Emma, please continue. I was going to say, I was, I was going to add to that and say, um, uh, you need to kind of change the mindset. You know, uh, a vehicle, kind of a three and a half ton transit van is, is a piece of equipment. It's a piece of dangerous equipment. It can do a lot of damage. You wouldn't expect somebody to uh, be given a chainsaw, for example, without the proper training. Why, why would um, organisations not think that's, that's the same requirement for somebody that drives a transit van, um, as an example, um, and to make sure that the person that drives that vehicle, it is a piece of work equipment, is, is, is adequately licensed to do so and is competent to do it. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely a change in mindset and, and thinking about, like Malcolm says, um, uh, anybody that drives on business is, is a professional driver is, is absolutely right. Great, thank you. Um, we hope that's answered your question. We have another question here, which I'll throw out to both of you if that's okay. Um, what additional challenges exist, if any, around checking licences for organisations that are largely operating a grey fleet? I'll 
I'm happy to go if, if you want. It's um, yeah. Yeah, gratefully, the, the biggest issue is, is actually clarifying who is a, who is a gratefully. The license check is the same um, okay. throughout the staff. It, it's actually clarifying, and as I try to put across um, in the presentation, the biggest issue is that customers seem to rely on the fact that the driver's made a claim. And we find often that 20, 25% of drivers who are actually get into their vehicles, the company won't even know they're doing it because they don't claim it's it's a small change in respect of, of, of what they do in a month um, on expenses or whatever. And it's just not claimed for because it's too difficult. Um, but every single person who takes a business mile should be um, checked. This, this day and age, it, it's very easy license checking using a third party supplier. The majority of checks are undertaken um, via an email or web link. Um, you fill out the form extremely quickly and the result is back from DVLA. I mean, I, I would say the norm now is three minutes from start to finish and that includes the result coming back from DVLA. And for you as well, um, you spoke a bit about um, the importance of managing driver mental health in terms of checking in on their well-being. Would you have to tell us a little bit about DriveTech's um, approach to doing this? Of course, no problem at all. Uh, we we offer um, actually kind of driver education and line manager education awareness workshops um, now delivered online as well, virtually, which kind of highlight the importance of mental health and why it's really important to make sure that your drivers are in a good place when they do get behind the wheel. Um, like I said, we, we have workshops that are now delivered online to kind of educate and aware, uh, make more, um, educate and, and, and make driver populations aware and line managers aware of their responsibilities, which isn't just about, you know, the physical act of driving, but is actually about making sure that your, your drivers are in a good place when they do get behind the wheel. Um, and like I said, in, within my presentation, there are, you know, various ways, ways to do that, um, monitoring regular one-to-ones, um, making mental health a priority within your organisation, um, making sure that actually it's included within the health and safety policy, that's really, really crucial. Um, and if you're implementing a driver risk management programme, actually linking in with the health and safety policy as well is, 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 is great and will actually give it a bit more momentum um, and hopefully be able to deliver better results and actually get engagement from all stakeholders within your organisation. Brilliant, thank you for that. That is all the questions that we have today and as we're just approaching three o'clock, unfortunately it's the time to end today's webinar. Um, a quick reminder that the um, full webinar presentations will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in the coming weeks and you'll be able to find them on the Global Fleet Champions website as well. Um, all that remains to do is thank today's speakers and to thank, thank today's sponsor Scribe Tech again. Um, we hope you found today's webinar interesting and have learned some information you can use to work towards our shared goal of safe and healthy mobility in fleets. If you'd like to continue the conversations we've had in today's Q&A session or webinar as a whole you can do so on our Global Fleet Champions Twitter page or our LinkedIn page as well. Thank you very much for attending today. The webinar will now conclude.